All right, thanks. Um, I'm, my job is just to introduce the project and to give you some idea of its scope and what our main objectives are. The more interesting results will be presented in a couple of uh, following talks, which I'll refer to, but um, this is just to set the scene if you'd like. Um, our project is a large offset funded project that was uh, created by um, the Commonwealth Government when they put conditions, ministerial conditions on Janakut Airport for clearing of, of native vegetation in their, um, in their lease area. And what's basically happened is that um, we were asked, our department was asked to carry out this offset because Janakut Airport themselves were unable to for various reasons. So it's become a third party offset and that's created a number of issues which I can talk to you about for quite a while but I don't think I'll bother today. But just, um, just to be aware that this project is funded from offset funding from Janakut Airport and it's a third party offset. Um, our objectives of the project are basically to, um, I suppose, partly re recover the uh, environmental impacts of clearing about 150 hectares of banks of woodland at Janakut Airport by a uh, number of um, processes. The key one is to try and replace some, create some new banks of woodland, which would be, um, I suppose, a full rep uh, replacement of the, what's lost if possible, but also we have a strong focus on repairing existing banks of woodland for reasons I'll explain later. We also have objectives to select sites using a rigorous ranking process, use scientific approaches uh, to be mo the most cost effective as possible in our management, and obviously um, use monitoring data to make that scientific management possible. And we're trying to maximize the areas we're using for obvious reasons to make the best use of this one-off funding opportunity. And um, we'd also um, like, we also have the opportunity now to provide advice about various different methods, both comparing creating new banks of woodland to repairing existing banks of woodland, and also to look at different ways of creating new banks of woodland. We also support community groups through funding and through knowledge and other processes, and we also have a key role in sharing information about banks of woodland. One of the, mo one of the most important bits of information we share are species lists for restoration projects. Um, so in terms of what the project has done in the last five years or so, um, we have a series of major, um, I guess you'd call them directions. The first one is, is creating new banks of woodland, which Anna will explain in a, in a, few, in a few talks. Um, the second major um, objective, or if you like, area of work is to manage environmental weeds in banks of woodland. And um, it says Karen Jackson, but actually Karen Clark will be presenting that talk right after lunch. Um, and we also have a major focus on monitoring banks of woodland and this is especially to look at recovery after fire and recovery after weed management to answer questions about how effective um, or how sustainable Banksia Woodland is. We've also, um, Van will be talking about that. We also have a brief presentation by Jeff about the fauna, how it comes back from restored areas. And we also work on a number of projects to do with the Grand Spider Orchid, which we won't talk about today. But if anyone's interested, just ask me. And uh, finally, we have established a funding application, a funding research. Um, we fund research collaborations. Um, some of the research collaborations include we've, we've funded a major project at Murdoch University, which Joe will be talking about, to do with topsoil seedling germination. We've also done a lot of work with the Threat and Flora Seed Center in Kensington to um, optimize germination and storage of native plants that we need for the revegetation. And we've also got a, a very productive collaboration with our GIST branch, uh, Ricky and Bart, who've done some really good work with us looking at overall vegetation cover and comparing different methods. And finally, we have uh, funded a project with Elaine Davis in a very small project, but Elaine will be talking about dieback in banks of woodland later. Um, there's also a number of consultations and partnerships we have outside of those funded relationships or direct collaborations. We work very closely with Greening Australia to manage Forestdale Lake, and also they've helped us direct seed some large areas, as Anna will explain. We work very closely with regional parks, obviously, because we work a lot in, in Janakot and Beelia Regional Park. We work with the Friends of Forestdale and other Friends groups, the City of Coburn and other local government areas, and BirdLife Australia has helped us for a number of years to provide volunteers for planting banks of woodland plants. And um, we've also helped provide uh, logistic support seeds and information to a number of other smaller or larger revegetation projects outside of our own. Um, just briefly about the community grants program, um, we have a, had a one-off funding project which is coming to an end in terms of the last of the acquittals now, but basically provide about $300,000 to a number of community groups and local government to look at revegetation of Banksy Woodland or management of Banksy Woodland for other issues like, such as dieback in 20 local government areas across Perth. 
And that was very successful, and that shows you some of the main participants at, at a workshop we held a year ago. Um, and if you want to find more about the projects, we have a series of annual reports that come out at, uh, each year, obviously, and then we've also got a number of other major reports which are available, and also we're now starting to publish articles in, um, in community uh, or, um, newsletters and so on to provide a short versions of everything, and um, we're all starting to also publish scientific papers which provide a more detailed approach if anyone needs that information. There are also a number of other resources. For example, we've got all our plot data is all available through the Atlas of Living Australia and Nature Map, and we have a number of um, websites that are just there to help people identify plants. Mm -hmm. One example is this Banksy Woodland Plant this website, which is just a Flickr site, but because of the way Flickr is designed, you can select um, shrub or and color and flowering time and it will tell you which ones are present at that time of year so there's just a few things like that we're trying to make available there's another resource which we're trying to accumulate information about the commonest invertebrates in our Banksy woodland areas as well that people can use because it's not that easy to identify plants necessarily especially if you're someone who doesn't use keys if you use keys then there's a lot more resources for you um, Another key thing we've been doing, as I mentioned, is setting up some comprehensive monitoring programs. You'll be hearing more about them later, but basically we've been asking the question, what happens when you manage weeds in Banksy Woodland? How long does it take for, for major benefits to become apparent in terms of plant diversity? And we've also looked at fauna diversity a bit. And we've also obviously doing a lot of management in, of, or monitoring in the revegetation areas. Um, in terms of where the Banksy Woodland monitoring sites are, you'll see some pictures of them later, but basically we, we selected five areas that are fairly representative of both Janicot Airport and the uh, re re revegetation sites, which are, um, um, our two major revegetation areas are here and here, but also we we have um, quite a few um, basically plots, 31 plots in areas of, of fairly good condition and also relatively weedy banks of woodland to look at the impacts of elk grass control. So you'll be hearing more about that project a bit later. And as part of that, um, we actually had one site Im impacted by fire. So we've actually turned it into a partly into a fire mat study. This wasn't planned, but it just happened because of the Banjo fire. Um, so when we monitor Banks of Woodland, we've got a fairly um, comprehensive now toolkit of, of um, methods. I won't go into details about them, but basically anyone who's interested in learning more about monitoring Banks of Woodland for your own projects or for your own purposes if you're managing a nature reserve, then we've got um, a number of techniques, including photo monitoring and plot-based monitoring, and we're now making those techniques available to the Row 8 Alliance for some of their, some of them will be useful to them. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got data available through NatureMap and other, and other um, avenues. Um, so in terms of Banks of Woodland Restoration, the man is, uh, Anna's going to present mostly information about that, but I'm just going to, to say a few brief um, introductions, if you like. Um, we had um, to decide where to, to carry out this restoration because there's an awful lot of Banksy Woodland in Perth and only a small amount of it is actually relatively close to Janicot Airport. As part of the offset, we were required to move topsoil from Janicot Airport to our restoration sites, so they can't really be that far from Janicot Airport. But we've also decided that it's really important that the restoration areas obviously have to be Banksy Woodland. Um, the major reason for the offset was loss of habitat for Carnaby's cockatoos, so it should be suitable habitat for their feeding, at least after it's restored. Um, vegetation as similar to Janicot Airport as possible because the soil's moving with it. Um, we're also looking for uh, suitable habitat for the ground spider orchid, and we've got other key concern, conservation concerns also went into the matrix. And this just gives you some idea of um, basically, I suppose, the red colors are closer matches to Janicot Airport are more environmentally significant and the other areas are further away. So, um, And topsoil was moved to the two areas of Forestry Lake and, and Ancatel Road, as Anna will explain. And obviously the sites, because we're doing a restoration project, we start with nothing, so, and we have to move from, uh, prove them from that point onwards, so they're very um, unimpressive at the beginning. Um, and the other key of focus of all this was to do scientific management, so we actually needed some information about Janicot Airport, and we found out very early in the project that they're about to clear um, the, the one area of Janicot Airport, and it would be the only area that we could source topsoil from for at least a few years, so we had a big rush on to find out what was actually there in the areas where the topsoil came from, so we did a fairly major floristic survey of the area. Um, what we needed to know is basically what plants are present, which ones are most common or abundant or dominant, and um, 
Also, we also want to know which types of groups of plants they are, so whether or not they're likely to come back and revegetation from the topsoil or not, based on the literature. Um, and we also needed lists to target seed collecting and also nursery orders. So we set up a series of, um, there's basically 12 uh, 10 by 10 meter quadrats inside larger 25 by 25 tree quadrats and also some transects. And we just use these to work out what, which plants are present and how, how, which, are real, which are most abundant. For example, that just shows you the tree data, which shows that, as you'd expect, the three Banksia species are relatively dominant in this Banksia woodland. Um, and this is the stems per hectare. But we've also got eucalypts and um, um, adenanthus and, and also nutsia, or, or the Christmas tree. So that just gives you some idea of what species <laughs> we want to return in terms of the overstory. I've done the same thing with the understory as well. Um, we've also, as I said, ranked the species according to whether or not they're likely to return from topsoil or whether we need to collect seed from them. And this is all based on literature, so we could well find we're wrong, but we at least wanted to have this information at the start. Um, and we've also identified what we consider difficult species where we, from, from past experience, we're unlikely to get much seed from seed collectors or the seed doesn't germinate well in the nursery, so we, we had to deal with those differently. Um, so in terms of reproductive categories, well, we originally immediately saw that we could have a major problem with returning all the species of Banksy woodland because about uh, 35 species are hard, are ranked as probably going to be difficult to return, while you know, only about 24 are in the category we think should be relatively easy to collect seed for and propagate in the nursery, and others fall in between in different categories. So we uh, realized that it wasn't going to be entirely straightforward returning this Banksy woodland. But we did expect quite a few to come from the topsoil. So we were hoping that for many, as many of these species as possible that we think are going to be difficult to, re to um, obtain elsewhere from any other means would come from the topsoil that was transferred. Um, and it was very, very useful having this information because it allowed us to determine the relative importance or the relative dominance of the plants that were in, in the Banksy woodland at Janicut Airport. So this will give us some idea of what may come out of the topsoil. But also, we were able to identify a number of species that were important, but, but um, you know, very important in terms of their dominance. And we actually sent them to a specialist nursery to be propagated um, to make sure that even if they don't come from seed or topsoil, we'd have some of them. Um, and this is how the data got, was used. We basically needed the, the topsoil reference site, and we also had some local reference sites to get uh, information from for the um, um, to, you know, to produce species lists for revegetation, and those species lists led to our seed collection targets, our seeding mix composition for direct seeding, our species lists, and also um, our completion criteria, which tell, you know, we will talk, to in a, talk about in a minute. So without this information, especially the information from Janicot Airport, it would have been very, very difficult to do this project. Um, focus primarily on the, on the species richness per quadrat because species richness overall is almost impossible to measure consistently. So we have a species richness per 10 by 10 meter equivalent. We have tree diversity, which basically we want all the trees to be back. But we also set targets for trees based on something fairly close to the numbers at Janicut Airport, about 300 stands per hectare total trees and about 250 for Banksy trees, because Banksy trees are the most important Carnaby's cockatoo food in this system. So we wanted them to be definitely be returned. We also set a target for understory density, which is about half of what we measured in the plots at Janicut Airport, but it's that kind of target. It tends to be a bit flexible. It depends upon the size of the plants you're returning. Larger plants, you don't need as many of them to, to, mat, to cover the site with vegetation when you do have smaller plants. And we also have targets for understory diversity and some of the key understory plants, which we just made sure were present, if at all possible. So um, another key focus has been repairing or comparing methods of rest restoration, which Anna can show you a bit of results from. But basically, because of the way this project was set up, we were only able to, to do about 20 hectares of topsoil restoration. So we've got a larger area outside the topsoil than in it. So we've got areas with planting and seeding with and without topsoil. And that gives people the, gives us the, the ability to say, what's the most effective method per, you know, per hectare or per dollar? And we've also trialed a few other things, for example, in areas which have already been planted or have, have enough plants that we can't do machine direct seeding. This is Greening Australia doing direct seeding for us. We've also been able to use hand direct seeding using our own staff to, just, to, to use a hoe and a PVC pipe, and that's also been very effective. But uh, the main way of returning seeding, uh, plants is through, um, through planting. 
as well on, on top of what came out of the topsoil. We've also got on information about what happens with fencing and what outside fencing. There's obviously big impacts of grazing. So. Um, another thing that we had to do was work out how, if our plot numbers that we have in our rehabilitation are actually effective. So we did a small species area relationship uh, experiment just to say if we have uh, in this case, 80 plots, is that enough to actually measure whether or not plant diversity is returning properly? And we found out that it will effectively measure the top most, the 60 most common species, but if you want to measure all the native plants in your site, the number of plots you need actually increases to cover the entire site, so you can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> but you have, so you have to be a bit realistic about monitoring as well. Um, a key thing about all our monitoring is we've, we've got relative dominance, um, either using density or foliage cover for all our species, and that gives us some really interesting results in that all of our areas, both the, the undisturbed and the rebedge areas, are dominated by a small, relatively small number of, un, of common species or important species, but there's also a huge number of relatively unimportant species that, in terms of their dominance, but they might become more important later on, so these are very diverse areas, even in the revegetation. Um, we've also have been able to work with Ricky and Ricky and Bart and Gist Branch to develop some really interesting monitoring techniques. I can't, won't be able to explain them in detail, but basically what they're showing is from using foliage cover uh, calculated from photographs, we can see that there's a trend for the annual natives and weeds to decline over time and the native plants perennial cover, which is most obvious in summertime, to, to increase. And it, as it's just, they've just crossed over, in fact, but um, we still have a long way to go before we can say this is fully sustainable, this system. Um, very briefly, we've got plants that are most common or only present in the restoration, and these tend to be um, disturbance opportunists from topsoil, um, and they also are similar to what we find after a fire. There's also species that are relatively uncommon in, in the restoration area, and these tend to be perhaps reseeders or whatever. So um, there's been a turnover. I'll just say that we've also been able to measure trees and learn a lot about tree growth, and a lot about the ecological sustainability of the sites, including animals and, and pollination. And we're also seeing some signs that these sites are, are sustainable, such as seed set and turnover of early species. Um, and there were some key, key questions that we needed to answer and, and, calculate, and perhaps summarize the information for other restoration projects, uh, such as what does it take to return a banksia tree? This is just some, an example of a, of a report card for banksia that tells you how to re recover it. And we're thinking about, this is the last slide, we're now thinking about extending this question or answering these questions about the sustainability of Banksia Woodland, especially restored Banksia Woodland, by setting up some research collaborations and using, in collaboration with WA Biodiversity Institute and others, we want to people to, um, I suppose we're looking for collaborators to think about some future collab some future research to continue answering the questions or measuring the, what's happening in the revet sites and ask questions about, does it look like a sustainable Banksia Woodland yet, or will it ever be? So that's the, where we're as far as I've got. Hmm. <laughs> much time I've got. Yeah.